hopefully they've improved pictures for you guys, but um, so let's just jump in and get started. Okay, crappy picture of okay, so conjunctivitis. So you have kind of two main types of conjunctivitis that you're having to kind of figure out. So which one do you think this is? So look at look at the size of the bumps is kind of the idea, which again it's always hard to tell. But if you look if you look at the <laughs> I guess this thing doesn't work. So right here, if you look at this slip beam, and you can kind of see these like lump areas here. So it's a follicular conjunctivitis. So anytime you see a follicular conjunctivitis, it, there's almost always it works now. I turned it on. Oh, and I have to go. So you're always going to have like a little papillary where it's just kind of this bland redness over here, and then you're going to have like larger follicles. So if you if you want to know what a follicle looks like, just pull any patient's conjunctiva in their lower lid, just pull it down really, really far, and you'll always see a few follicles in the fornix. And so you can kind of get an idea of, of what, uh, what type of conjunctivitis it is. Okay, so patient presents with chronic follicular conjunctivitis. All the following could be the cause except. So HSV, yes. definitely, yes. right? Molluscum, yes. definitely. Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Yes. Chronic ocular environmental allergies. Yes. Which one do you think? Three. It's probably Stevens-Johnson, right? Stevens-Johnson is just going to kind of cause it's like an irritation, like kind of a like papillary conjunctivitis, and you'll usually see uh, membranes, right, with with Stevens Johnson syndrome. So the term chronic um, in kind of a follicular reaction is technically over four weeks, um, and somebody came up with this bat map lap, kind of try to to try to remember them all. I never was very good at remembering these lists of things, um, but these are kind of all the ones that. The main ones are going to be viral, and then you've got like things like trachoma, like chlamydia, molluscum. Um, you're always going to want to look at the lid margin, looking for molluscum lesions, um, and then there's a bunch of other random ones that don't come up as much. Okay, another question. So patients after hyphema, so they've, they've had a trauma, they've got an intraocular hyphema, are more likely to develop corneal blood staining due to all the following except. So what can cause corneal blood staining? Definitely high pressure. Okay. Probably pigs. Okay. I imagine like sickle cell trait, are they getting that because of the re-bleeds? Yep, it just kind of, it just kind of leads to maybe a prolonged course. So the, the idea is if, if the blood doesn't clear quickly, then you'll get it. Or if they have high pressure, they'll get it. Or if they have some other endothelial condition, um, they can get it as well, like Fuchs. And the method of injury has no bearing on it, right? Okay. All right, CIN. So you've got a patient that comes in with CIN. How do you treat it? What is CIN? Okay. So we're thinking this is some sort of lesion growing on the, on the conjunctiva that's in the spectrum of a squamous cell carcinoma, right? So you can have all the way from benign growths on the conjunctiva, which are like a pinguecular pterygium, all the way to squamous cell cancer, right? So that spectrum sort of in between those is a CIN. And you can have any variation of this. A lot of vets have this, so you'll see a lot of these at the VA. And you have to kind of decide, okay, how am I going to manage this? So you've gotten to the point on this patient where... You probably want to do something. Does mitomycin C work for this? Yes. Not not very well. You would usually actually do what for it? Or what what topical treatment might you do? Alpha. So interferon alpha works for it. Mitomycin is actually not the treatment of choice for CIN. Mitomycin might be the treatment of choice for what other ocular kind of growth on the on the eye. Pam. So it works well for Pam. Um, that melanoma kind of spectrum of pigmentation, okay? So you either have simple excision, which is the, the least good option up here. Uh, mitomycin C, not a great option. So you've got wide local excision with topical steroids. 
It's going to help prevent what if you do topical steroids after this? Scarring. Scarring, right? So that's going to be helpful a little bit. But what you really need to do is wide local excision with cryotherapy. And what's the term that they like to use for the cryotherapy technique that you use when you're doing cancer killing? So no touch for sure, but the cryo part, you have double freeze thaw. So what that means is that you freeze the edge of the conjunctiva where you excise this and you let it thaw, so you kind of just move all the way around it, and then you repeat it, so you do it twice. And what that essentially does is it kills any cells um, that you didn't excise. And you're trying to excise everything that you can see. We haven't gotten to the point where we're doing Mohs for this on the surface of the eye, so we, we usually just, you can't really take, you know, like the classic four, even four millimeter margins are kind of big on, on some of these, and so you usually try to take a couple of millimeter margins on them. Okay, another really crappy picture. I did it on purpose, just so you know, because I feel like OCAP sucks at their pictures. And this is what they all seem to look like. They were all grainy and crappy. Okay, so somebody help me describe what you see, just to kind of get an idea of what's going on. <laughs> Slides. There's a pink opacification at the limbus with a lot of uh, vessels nearby. Okay, so we got conjunction, maybe some whitening here. Hallucinate that it's a little elevated too. So just right at the limits. No contact lens wear, no trauma. What's your diagnosis? You gotta come up with something. And this, usually the question will kind of help you sort of get an idea of what they're maybe leaning toward. <clears throat> so a little inflammatory lesion on the conjunctiva, what type of hypersensitive reaction is happening? You gotta jump, you gotta jump even further. So if, these are usually in kids that they'll come in and they'll have this little elevated red spot on their conjunctiva. Flictenule, yeah, good. So flictenule is what kind of hypersensitivity reaction? So you got type one, type two, type three, type four, type seven, I don't know. <laughs> so it happens to be a type four hypersensitivity reaction. <laughs> Um, so this is a little bit of a better picture of what they'll look like. It'll almost look like a, like a necrotizing scleritis is what you're kind of like worried about initially, but it's going to be just almost like a little ulcerative lesion on the conjunctiva. Um, it reminds me of what like a, an ulcer with a canker would look like in the, in the mouth. Um, so we don't have great information about these because they can sort of just be anything um, that can cause this, but they can be infectious. So you have staph is probably the most common cause of them. Um, and then obviously you're, you're always worried about tuberculosis when you see somebody with this, so you're asking about exposure and travel and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, a, it's a lymphocytic sort of um, collection of inflammation, and so um, really the treatment is topical steroids. And usually you do like a tobramycin or something with it, so like a tobradex or a maxitrol would usually get these to melt away pretty nicely. So if it doesn't seem to respond to this treatment, you'd want to culture it and kind of go from there and see if it's something else. But they're, they're trying to get you to test for tuberculosis when, when you have a flick tenule, okay? All right, another funky picture. It's kind of blurry, but it helps you understand sort of what's going on. Who can describe what's happening? Uh, the what is this? Slit lid, is it the lower lid? Okay, lower lid. And then we have what appears to be a large corneal abrasion. Okay, so we've got missing skin, right? Yeah, rolled up okay. edges. Got some rolled up edges, what's this? This is the sclera. Okay, so we've got the upper limbus here, right? Yeah. Okay, so where is this gonna be? Superior. So superior up underneath the eyelid, right? Okay. It's like a shield ulcer. Shield ulcer. Okay, so good. So you kind of have to sort of take a step back and say, okay, where am I? What's the most likely thing that they're trying to get me to, to think of here? So if you have, if you take a step back and you say, so what causes abrasions on the upper cornea? Or what causes the skin to break down in the upper cornea? So you talked about foreign body, a, a shield know. ulcer, but a foreign body is a big one that they'll want you to think of too, okay? So those are kind of the two main ones. So you'd always want to flip that upper lid and see what's going on up there. Okay, so this patient presents with the following finding after years of battling allergies. What is the cause of this finding? So which one of these is kind of an 
allergy type appearance, right? Burnal. So if you look at these other ones, you could have any of these, right? Recurrent erosions. It could be herpes simplex. It could be a traumatic epithelial defect. It could be a foreign body in the upper eyelid. Uh, but it's kind of that location of it being up underneath the, the lid in somebody with kind of an allergy type appearance or look, okay? Shield ulcer. So, ulcer. so vernal keratoconjunctivitis is a type one and a type four hypersensitivity reaction. They're usually young people. Um, and we don't have a lot of them here in Utah, but we do get a fair amount of them. Um, they usually present with just this really nasty, um, beefy, tarsal conjunctival sort of inflammation. Um, typically, it's better on its own. Um, this is kind of your link to it. So somebody who has like a really bad sort of atopic dermatitis, so they're going to kind of go down that path of trying to get you to think about more systemic issues. Um, there's kind of two types. There's some that are just right at the limbal um, sort of involvement, and then some that are more on the lids. So it's kind of this cobblestone papillae is kind of the big one, and they have these huge septae kind of in between them that separate those papillae out. Okay, so that's vernal conjunctivitis. All right, Marshall, what's wrong with this guy? Uh, major things are very. Uh Floppy eyelid syndrome potentially with very uh, large lid laxity. Okay. So don't do this to yourself too much, but if you try this, you can't do it to your eyelids because your eyelids are normal, right? Mm -hmm. I try to tell patients, like, I can't, like, flip my eyelid over just by doing this. Um, whereas in somebody who has really bad floppy eyelid syndrome, you can, right? Okay. So they're always going to think about what's the scariest thing with floppy eyelid syndrome. This patient has the following chronic medical condition. Sleep at me, right? So that's going to kill them because it causes pulmonary hypertension and heart disease and chronic oxygen deprivation, and and they're tired at work all the time, and they might fall asleep while they're driving to work. You know, so it's the thing that's going to kill them is the sleep at me, and so that that's what they're going to get you to think of. So how do you treat floppy eyelid syndrome, Marshall? You can use an uh, antibiotic and steroid ointment like Maxitrol, um, especially if they're having crusting of. Um, their eyes, um, and if they feel like the antibiotic ointment is helpful, but then they get crusting back, and they can do um, eyelid surgery to tighten up, <clears throat> tighten up the lids. Um, okay. Also, it treats sleep apnea, of course. Okay, so what, what's the mechanism of their sort of ocular inflammation? What happens? Um, At least, what, what do we think is happening? It's like air is getting under the lids because the lids aren't tightly opposed to the globe. Um, and sometimes these guys, they'll actually like flip, their lids will actually flip over. They'll get like tarsal plate inversion while they're sleeping. And so that they'll get kind of that chronic sort of mechanical irritation on their lids. <laughs> For some reason, a lot of people with sleep apnea actually sleep on their faces. It's like the strangest thing. It's like, I can't breathe and I'm going to suffocate myself at the same time. So, so okay, there's a ton of sort of other issues with this. So what um, what's a cornea problem with uh, floppy eyelid syndrome. Anybody know the cornea connection to floppy eyelid syndrome? I mean, I would think like some like lag, maybe, maybe some just like uh, surface disease, like recurrent. Yeah, you've got, you've got all that kind of chronic irritation stuff, right? Yeah. But there's something different structurally with the cornea. Carried Oh, yeah. So I don't know that we know the exact mechanism, but I mean, I, I tell my keratoconus patients to stop sleeping on their faces <laughs> to try to get keep their well head off. Stop sleeping on their faces. It's crazy. Like, to, if you talk to young kids or, like, teenagers or 25-year-olds with uh, keratoconus, they sleep on their face. It's, like, the strangest thing. I don't get it. Just, like, face down. Yeah. Like, I don't know how you sleep that way, but they seriously sleep on their stomach, on their face. And then they'll have like a little oh, opening yeah. for their mouth. That's what I've always wondered. They do need a massage too. Massage that sounds pretty good. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a good approach. Okay, so this um, is a papillary conjunctivitis. So there's typically no follicles, and you're not seeing like a filamentary keratitis with it. So it's a kind of easily everted upper eyelids. Um, so you have to touch your patients sometimes uh, to kind of figure this out. Um, and the, the underlying problem seems to be this decrease in elastin in the tarsal plate. So um, you've got obesity, sleep apnea, eyelid rubbing, keratoconus. So the treatment really is to protect that eye. So either wear a shield at night, tape the eyelid closed at night, obviously do some sort of a lubrication on it. 
Um, if you can just lubricate, the inflammation will go away. Sometimes it does need a steroid to kind of calm it down like Marshall was talking about. Like chronic erythromycin ointment is not that bad, big of a deal in a patient like this to try to keep some of that crusting away. Um, and then you have this, uh, what is this surgical lid tightening procedure? What do they call it? It's oh, a wedge resection. resection. Wedge resection. Have you guys ever seen one? Mm -hmm. They're kind of weird. They seem like so, I don't know, invasive, yeah. but they seem to work okay. It'll come back if they continue to leave things untreated. <laughs> All right, I gave you a little better picture because I just have a really good picture of this. I thought it was a good picture. So this is a patient that I actually saw um, when I was uh, in fourth year. They showed up in my continuity clinic. Um, and they had, kept, they had lost vision over the last week. What was their claim? True, false. False. Completely false, right? <laughs> no chance. No chance that you could have lost vision over the last week. I mean, I mean maybe. Like right here? Like you were looking down and had your, I don't know, but no chance of that. Okay, so what, what's happening here? What is this called? You got blood vessels on the surface of the cornea, you got blood vessels in the stroma of the cornea. It's kind of deeper, I can, you can't really appreciate the depth of it. Some of these are superficial, but it's kind of full thickness in the cornea. So blood vessels in the deep cornea. I think I heard it. Yes. Inner... Somebody say it? No, no I said the most stem cell deficiency. Oh, okay. It could be that. But this is interstitial keratitis is what they're trying to get at. Just kind of deeper, deeper blood vessels kind of growing in the cornea. You'll also get them up on the surface too, even if you have that deep vessel um, kind of growing. Okay, so patient presents with the following condition. What is not a cause of this condition? Thyroiditis. Good. So thyroid eye disease can cause chronic eye irritation, right? But it's usually just going to cause kind of a, kind of like a marginal neovascularization just right at the edge of the cornea. Uh, but interstitial keratitis can be caused by anything. So you're thinking something that causes infection or really bad inflammation of the, of the ocular surface. So a chemical burn can do it. I actually have a patient that's like, it's one of the most challenging cases that I've ever had to deal with, who... Um, drank, fell asleep, was like passed out on a heating pad. And so he fell asleep on a heating pad on his face somehow. I don't know why he had it on his face. But he burned his eye. So it was like a, a thermal keratitis and it caused interstitial keratitis, like deep vascularity of the, of the cornea. Um, syphilis can also do it. So thyroid eye disease is the one that does not do this. Okay, so interstitial keratitis, um, the one that they love to get at is this um, syphilis congenital is most likely bilateral. Um, if it's unilateral, then it's more of an acquired syphilis later in life. Um, you have this Hutchinson's triad with congenital syphilis where you get the teeth abnormalities and, and deafness as well. Um, tuberculosis, HSV, Lyme, these things are always something that you should have in your differential when you've got neovascularization of the cornea. Um, and then you have this Kogan's um, sort of triad as well, maybe quad, what do they call it? Um, we have vertigo, tinnitus, hearing loss, so it's involving the eighth cranial nerve. Um, other less common causes, so you have to kind of think about all these things, but um, it's, it's usually something that you don't really come up with a diagnosis on. Um, and you treat them for a viral keratitis just to cover them, and then how, how are you going to treat that? How are you going to get rid of that? So they might present this to you and say, what are the treatment options for this? You need steroids to start off just to see if you can kind of calm down that inflammation and scar, but I think it eventually requires a PK. Yeah, so you have, you have different options before that that you could try. Um, so steroids is kind of the mainstay is to try to just calm down any active inflammation. Active inflammation is what drives new blood vessels to grow. And so you can probably get some of this stuff to regress that's kind of on the edges. Um, these big vessels are probably not going to regress with topical steroids. So what could you do to these big vessels? Burn. So you can burn them. So what are the methods of burning a vessel? There's a couple of different ones. Just use the... Uh, uh, yeah. So you can do cautery, yeah. right? Yeah. Is there anything else? Well, you can do some in clinic. 
I'd attempt pottery. I'd do that in the OR. <laughs> but you could do it in clinic. Mm -hmm. You could do some with a laser. So you can use an argon laser to actually ablate them. And that, again, may not work on a big vessel, but it would probably work on these. You could ablate those vessels. Um, okay, what else could you do in clinic? Are there medicines that you could use? Be using my yeah, Maybe. What did you say? Like a vasoconstrictor. Well, that's a temporary thing. Like, maybe you put them on Lumify, Alphagan, something to kind of close them off. What about, what, what causes, what, how do we treat neovascularization in other parts of the eye? Anti-VEGF, right? So you could do, so Avastin is actually kind of approved for this. So you could do subcon Avastin kind of in this area, which is what I ended up doing on my thermal burn guy, and it worked okay. It didn't work perfectly, but it, it regressed the vessels pretty well. So you might do a series of three over the course of three months and see if you can get it to regress. They typically come back. It's not like... I don't feel like it's like the retina issues where you can actually get it to go quiescent over time, but maybe you can eventually. So you brought up an interesting one um, is mitomycin C, which um, you could potentially do that topically to kind of help it. Um, but there was a guy just recently who actually took a cannula or a needle and injected mitomycin C into the vessels. Like he actually cannulated the vessels and injected it. And it, it actually made it pretty much completely go away on a case that looked pretty similar to this. Not published yet, not really widely agreed upon that that's okay, because if you inject mitomycin into the stroma, the cornea would probably melt it, but he claims he got right into the vessel. So kind of an interesting one. Um, there's other sort of vascular surgeons that will actually go in and sclerose vessels by injecting, is it like a soap or something? So you could put like a, I think it's called like saponification of vessels. So you could potentially do that. But these, these are tricky because you may end up needing a PK. What's the problem with a PK in this setting, though? So the vessels are going to be right at the edge of the graft. So it's probably going to regrow, but rejection. rejection, right? Super high risk of rejection in that setting. So you'd want to try to calm these down, get them to be as ghost vessels as you can before you go in and do a surgery. All right. All right, what do you got? Nevis. Paris. <laughs> this right here. We put a picture on OCAPS for this. <laughs> it's really bad. Looks like a white iris, too. So a really light iris. Should the limbus ever look like this? You should never have pigment on the cornea, right? Any ideas? Eyes reflection. OK, good. OK, so the patient has the following Finding. That's what I think that's the exact picture from OCAP. So that's crazy. You went and found it. <laughs> I remember having a picture that looked pretty much like, like that. that. <laughs> okay, so the patient has the following finding. So they have PSC cataracts, they have hypertension, they have splitter hemorrhages, they have decreased plasma. Do they have some? Are they PSC or are they inferior? Increasing. Increasing. Yeah. Maybe. So what's the disease? Wilson's. Okay, so Wilson's disease. I want you to come to the bedside and see if they have the Kaiser plate. <laughs> Can't see them. I've tried. So they actually do have decreased ceruloplasma, increased copper. So it was that one. And they have this sunflower cataract. <laughs> yes, <you> got right. <laughs> um, so it's it's copper deposition in decimase membrane. Okay, that's kind of the key. And then the treatments that they'll sometimes get into, and it, it actually does go away with adequate treatment. That's another item that might show up on the test. If you have a Kaiser Fleischer ring, it's not just in Wilson's disease. There's actually some other really weird things that can cause it too. But it all has to do with that ceruloplasmin that kind of binds to copper. Okay. Uh, I forgot my picture. <laughs> But I don't think you need to know. They probably don't remove the lens. You're not going to remove anything else, right? So a patient had this lesion <laughs> removed, what kind of line would be present on the cornea exam? Stop. Okay, so a Fleischer ring is in what? Wilson. Which is this Fleischer ring, like the Kaiser Fleischer ring, but this one's different. 
So the keratoconus, so that's a, that's a round um, iron deposition in just kind of around the apex of the cornea, right? So it's going to be displaced a little inferior with keratoconus. Okay, a soccer line is a pterygium, right? I have a really good picture of this, and maybe that's, I might have fallen asleep trying to find it, but. And then a, what's a fairy line? That's the bleb. So I always think of a fairy being water and, and bleb, so we're kind of dealing with water and trying to move it around. And then the hudson Stolly line is just like, I, I just think of like a Russian with like this straight line or something, I don't know, that just like is just, just above the lid. It's where the tear film kind of just deposits a little bit of iron. So it's like a, a millimeter or two above that lower lid margin. Okay, did everybody have good breakfast? Okay. Yeah. Maybe. I almost did when I saw this. Yeah. This is one of our own patients at the Moran. Okay, so B1 zoster. Okay. So what what makes you think this is zoster and not something else? Like, cause what are you gonna use on this to set kind of determine on, on just a test to say this looks like zoster compared to other issues with it? Doesn't that. cross the midline. So yeah, the biggest key is if you draw a line right up the nose, there's nothing coming across. Okay. And then the other thing is that if you take it and you kind of say, okay, V1 is typically sort of out here at the lateral campus and goes up this way. Sometimes you'll get a little bit of crossover in that lower lid, but you're typically not getting much lower lid involvement, right? So lower lid actually looks reasonable. And it's mostly just this upper lid right on the forehead. I had a patient one time that came in for, um, she had supposedly been splashed by a chemical at work and she was trying to get disability from her work because and she was suing them. And uh, she said that somebody had like sprayed a chemical on her and she developed a rash. And the rash was on one side of her face. Like you look up in her, she's like, I've got stuff in my scalp all over it. It was literally just like in her hair, one side, face, one side, nothing over here, nothing up here. So you have zoster. This is not a chemical injury, it's zoster. Because it's that dermatomal thing, okay? So that's the key to it. I had a patient yesterday present with V2 zoster, just like right here. So what are you worried about with zoster? Well, there's a lot of things, but can you give me the rundown of what they're going to test you on, what things they're going to be worried about on the exam? So clearly the cornea is involved here, right? I don't know if it's involved because the lid sucks or if it's actually infected, but the cornea is hammered. Um, so intraocular involvement too, right? So you could potentially get a uveitis or ARN, right? in the retina. So you're having to dilate them and try to get a look back there. Um, so you're going to deal with all the eye issues. Okay. So what else? You want to worry, like, think about their just like systemic immune status as well, but their immune okay. compromised. Good. Or immune so is this a disseminated thing? Are they altered in your clinic? Are they having a hard time like understanding what's going on? Do they seem like they're, uh, they've got it going on in centrally, like CNS involvement, right? Okay, you're going to check their pressure for sure. What if they're saying things just sound muffled to me? Yeah, so you can get the Ramsey Hunt syndrome where they've actually got cranial nerve 8 involvement, which my patient yesterday, I was, she was like, I'm having, like, I feel like it's muffled. I said to her, how's your hearing? Feels muffled. Have they done anything about that? What are you going to do for that? So they'll actually, they'll actually test hearing. So they, they'll actually do hearing tests to kind of see what the frequency of their hearing is doing. And they can kind of follow that over time. But you're going to treat it with what? Steroids. They're going to steroids for that part of it. So she was on Valtrex, on an appropriate dose of Valtrex. She'd just been diagnosed like two days before I saw her. She had a prodrome of symptoms, which is sometimes really challenging to figure out. So I've actually missed it. Um, I had a patient that came in that was like complaining of swelling in her cheek and it just felt like tight. She didn't have any lymph nodes that were positive. I wasn't sure what was going on. So when I was a, a fellow, she came in the next week with just raging um, zoster. And this patient presented the same thing. She went to Instacare. She had a swollen cheek kind of around her ear, just felt funny. And then like two days later broke out in zoster. So um, you've got to watch out for the hearing part of it along with it. So. Okay, so what's the optimal treatment for this patient? 
they only have eye involvement, nothing else. Nothing, right? Just watch them, see how it goes. Uh, surgical debridement. Maybe this is like a necrotizing fasciitis. Again, that midline idea, right? Try to try to look for that midline and get that out. So obviously we're doing oral valtrex and then kind of a low threshold to use oral steroids in something like this probably with how bad it is. Once they've kind of got appropriate coverage of the antivirals, so maybe like three, four days into it. Um, other considerations long-term with the zoster? Neurotrophic. Yeah, so neurotrophic pain is probably, or neuropathic pain, whatever you want to call it. It's probably the, it's probably the biggest long-term consequence of having zoster, no matter where it is. And, and how do you prevent it, or what's the idea if you do something, you might be able to minimize the risk of it. Or, I mean, yeah, but I know. It's really getting an antiviral started in the first five days is kind of what they think. So, and then you may treat it with like a gabapentin. Ask you about the injection. Oh, I don't know. Could be. I'm not sure on that one. <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of a weird one where they'll have, they'll come in with a, um, a dendrite and have no pain. It's kind of a weird thing. HSV usually causes pain compared to zoster. Um, so zoster has asymptomatic dendrites is kind of the way to think of it. So they don't even know they have them. Their vision might be slightly blurry. Um, but the, the treatment for zoster keratitis is essentially steroids, okay? We're trying to figure out if, if chronic antivirals help, but we don't know because we don't have a good enough study on it yet. I tend to keep my patients on it for a little bit longer than the two or three week course that's kind of um, recommended. And then you've got all these other things that you have to think about here. Is it random or seven or eight? Facial paralysis, Ramsey, huh? Confused now. Which one's the? I thought that was the um, the hearing one. The ocular one. I think it's the vestibular nerve, right? Yeah. Or, sorry, it's vestibular. vestibular. No, that that was I forgot that. I don't seven is facial paralysis, and I think that is Ramsey. That is Ramsey. Huh? So you got to watch out for eight involvement too. Okay. Um, so this is kind of the treatment that you have to come up with. So it's either you're kind of going high doses here. So 800 milligrams five times a day. Ambu or 500 three times a day or Valtrex, one gram TID. It's kind of full treatment dose. And if you can get that started within the first three to five days, then you lower the risk of their chronic pain afterwards, which can be really debilitating and bad. Okay, so trying to figure out dendrites and appearances between that dendrite versus pseudodendrite. So this is trying to say, okay, is this HSV versus VZV? Um, so the dendrites in HSV just look clean. That's kind of the way that I would think of them. It just looks like a perfect branching um, lesion like this one up here. Um, you get uh, the base that stains well with fluorescein, the edges with rose bengal, that's what this is trying to get at here. Um, whereas a pseudodendrite is just like blunt ends, so it just doesn't look, it just kind of looks fuzzy on the edges. Um, and you tend to get a little bit more of the geographic ulcerations on this too, so you, it may not be a perfect pseudodendrite. And then not really great stain on them, and then steroids here, you're not going to treat it. Here you are going to treat it with steroids. So, and I'm usually pretty chicken about this, so I don't start the steroid initially on first presentation. So I might wait a week to get it going. All right, another blurry picture, but I think this one's actually a pretty good blurry picture. Like you can tell what's going on here. So somebody describe this to me. It's a ring infiltrate, hypopia, and the eye is very injected. Okay, good. So lots of conjunction, hypopion. You got that flat whitening that's a hypopion layered out things inside the eye, and then a ring. So it's dense around the edges, a little clear in the center. Okay. So what are you thinking? Twenty-six-year-old contact lens wearer, ten out of ten pain. What treatment is most likely to lead to success? Good. So we're gonna get the pool cleaner going. Hexidine. So corneal scraping, maybe. Is corneal scraping a treatment for acanthamoeba? Absolutely. Yeah, if it's epithelial. So you can actually cure somebody of acanthamoeba if they present with epithelial acanthamoeba only by scraping them. 
but it can be, it's really challenging to diagnose them when they're at that point because there's nothing that's kind of leading you to say that's what it is outside of what? What can you get to kind of help you know? It's a confocal, right? That's the only thing that's going to really help you know this is epithelial acanthamoeba. This deeper stuff, there's no way you're going to get that out by scraping, okay? You're not going to be able to debulk it, so don't even, don't even try. You do have to try to scrape it maybe to get a diagnosis, kind of get deep in there and see if you can scrape it. Um, what about this? No. What's wrong with the PK? If they actively have it, it'll probably recur. Yeah, so if you look at this, like where is there acanthamoeba? Who knows, right? It could be anywhere. <laughs> but what, what, if, uh, what if it's out in the sclera? What if you've actually got infiltrate into the sclera? It's crossed the limbus. And then what are you dealing with? You're probably dealing with the death of the eye. It's pretty much impossible to treat. You may have to go on to like radiation or cross-linking of it with collagen to try to try to kill it. Like it's just once it gets into the sclera, you're pretty much uh, pretty much host. So here you could argue that you could do a PK to debulk it, but you're kind of at huge risk of it reoccurring in the PK, which isn't the end of the world because sometimes that gets you a little bit ahead of the game because you're probably gonna have to do a PK anyway. But these can be really challenging cases. Um, but yeah, it's going to be chlorhexidine is kind of your main treatment. And then you've got other, other medications like PHMB, Rolene. Um, there's oral medications. Sometimes you put them on like IV uh, medications as well to kind of help with it. So if you look at all the different sort of issues with acanthamoeba, it's really, it's a trophozoite. Um, it has these epithelial cysts, which this is where you can actually cure it if you can get this, if you can get, get it out at that point. Um, as soon as it gets into the deeper kind of ring-shaped infiltrate, then you're probably ending up with a PK because it's hard to get it to completely clear. Um, confocals are really your best treatment. Um, you can get it to grow on this fancy line here that's always on OCAPS, this non-nutrient agar with E-coli overlay. Um, they're double-walled cysts, which is what you're looking for on the confocal. So if it's superficial, theoretically you can debride it and it will go away. Again, it's rare because you have to have a really low suspicion for it. High suspicion. High suspicion for it, but you probably have a low suspicion for it. Um, again, you're usually using chlorhexidine and PHMB. Rolling is something that you can technically get from outside the U.S. It's becoming harder and harder to get it to come in, but you used to be able to just get it on Amazon. If you look at the bottle on rolling, it just says for minor eye infections, which is fantastic because we use it for like the worst eye infection that we get in the U.S. And then um, there's all these other treatments that you can get or that you could use as well that seem to have some sort of um, benefit. So this is a patient that I saw at the Marin um, with a, a really tricky clinical course. I thought she had, she actually presented with an endothelial plaque on her cornea, high risk contact lens wear, but it just looked like an endotheliitis. So I treated her like it was a viral um, keratitis um, kind of got a little better, and then a week later presented with this really dense hypopion. And I was like, uh, that shouldn't happen. So I kind of took a step back and was like, well, what, what could be causing this? She had almost like a little mild infiltrate in her cornea, so I started her on broad spectrum antibiotics. And she came back and she was worse. And her pain was always like 10 out of 10. And she didn't really have a lot of epi defects. So it was like just really confusing. Did this confocal on her. And that's what kind of sealed it. It presented like a viral keratitis and then ended up being a candomiba. So these are the cysts that you'll see in the cornea. What's this? What is this linear thing in the cornea? A nerve. A nerve, yeah. So this, is, this should be actually pretty clear. This is actually a good picture, but it's not very clear because it has perineuritis. So that nerve will kind of look like it's just not crisp. Have you ever seen pictures of corneal nerves? They just look really thin and crisp. So this one's got perineuritis. And for whatever reason, these acanth amoeba cysts will tend to like line up. So you'll kind of get a marching out, kind of lining up on the confocal. So amoebic cysts there. You can get these subbomen cysts, which is what these are. And then perineuritis, okay? So, um, I've probably managed like four patients with acanthamoeba in four years, so it's not terribly common, but they're awful. 
So she ended up, the patient that presented for me ended up with a PK and then a repeat PK. And she showed up as a nurse in the OR one day at Marin and was doing fantastic. Love and life. But, okay. Did she have a good reason to have an eye infection? So she was kind of an interesting one. She did wear contacts, um, but she was actually pretty good at her contacts. She, was, she wasn't really sleeping in them. She was a nurse um, up at Huntsman, I think, at the time. Um, but she took a trip to Mexico, and she was swimming in them some, and she was showering with them in. And so I th we think it was just the water source in Mexico that she got them. So that was the hard, other hard thing is it was like, you don't have a great reason to have a contact lens keratitis. <laughs> All right, what do we think here? Keratoconus. Good. So that's kind of what you have to jump to. It's like, I see a picture, it's keratoconus. Okay, so then you take a step back and you say, they could ask me a trillion different things about keratoconus. <laughs> keratoconus is a disease that you just have to know front to back, back to front, up and down. You've got to know everything about it, okay? Those big ones, you just have to know everything about it so that they don't, they don't fool you. So 28-year-old with increasing keratometry readings, what's the recommended treatment? So what what are they trying to get at here? Want to stabilize it. He's progressing, right? Progressive, unstable keratoconus. There's an FDA approved treatment for that now, and is it intact? Is it a PK? No, it's collagen crosslinking. So they, they want you to crosslink these patients with unstable keratoconus. So all of these are treatments for it, and even this, in some cases, if they've got that floppy eyelid problem, or what if uh, they're not progressing? So if they're not progressing, you can't cross-link them, at least currently, because you have to prove progression for it to be FDA approved. But some people argue that you should cross-link anybody who presents with keratoconus. But yeah, if they're not progressing, you just follow them closely until they do. You can do intacts for non-progressive keratoconus. You can do PKs for non-progressive keratoconus. There's kind of two different ways that I manage keratoconus. One is vision, okay? You've got the vision pathway. How do we get your vision better? Glasses, contacts, kind of intacts, potentially. Um, and then the second pathway is how do we keep you from progressing? And some people think that if you put them in hard contact lenses, it's kind of like this suspender that you're putting on the cornea to kind of help it, and it doesn't work. So the only treatment for progressive keratoconus is cross-linking. If it gets too bad that you can't cross-link them, then you're looking at a PK or a DALC or some sort of a cornea transplant. Okay? Do you ever do for someone who has progressed so bad that you need to do a PK, do you do a PK and then just like do cross-linking? Because um, it doesn't recur in the graft a lot of times. Yeah, I mean, I, it's been looked at. It doesn't work as well as you think it would. Because okay. um, you're trying to secure that kind of graft host junction with the cross-linking is kind of the idea. Because that's where it usually recurs is kind of in that lower portion. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to be that effective. So you, you still can get progression. but Potentially, yeah, absolutely, that'd be the way you do it. So we try to create a pretty good scar inferiorly with keratoconus scraps. So you try to do long sutures, um, and then you try to really tuck that cordia down. So a shallow pass through the donor, deep pass through the host to kind of keep it, keep it low so you're not getting donor elevation. And then I usually, I try to keep those sutures in longer if I can to try to help, help it scar down because that's the area where it's gonna protrude the most. Okay, so keratoconus is typically bilateral. You have all these systemic things, so that's why they're gonna, they're gonna hammer you on these systemic things. Um, Down syndrome patients are really common. Other connective tissue diseases like Ehlers-Danlos Marfan's. Um, there's tons of ocular associations with it. Um, it's this inferior steepening with apical thinning. You've got the Fleischer ring, the Boat striae. You've got prominent corneal nerves. I mean, there's just tons and tons of stuff to, that are testable on this, so. So that one was this sign here, Munson sign. Okay. And then high drops is another one that they'll, um, they'll try to get you to do something risky on. So when somebody presents with high drops, you're not, you're not treating them with PK initially. And it's not an infection. So that's the hard thing to kind of figure out. Do they have an infection? Is this high drops? Do they have a history of keratoconus? It's most likely high drops. And then you just kind of watch it. It's mostly just supportive care initially. Some people will put an air bubble in the anterior chamber, because um, what is hydrops? So decimase membrane has actually ruptured from the stress of that cornea, kind of protruding forward. And so if you can put an air bubble in there, you could potentially replace decimase membrane quicker. 
So it seems to help. I don't like to do it in somebody who's phagic because you're probably going to push a cataract forward unnecessarily. And I, I usually just watch them. And they'll usually, this is where you'll end up with an apical scar is after they've had high drops with keratoconus. That last one, apical or aqueous suppressants, it doesn't show up on the... I don't know why that one. Aqueous suppressants, possible intracameral area. Why do you do aqueous suppressants? The idea is just if you have um, high fluid in the eye, pressure in the eye, you're going to get more fluid rushing into the cornea all the time. So the idea is if you, if you lower intraocular pressure, there's maybe that less of that drive for it to push into the okay. into the stroma. But I usually don't. I usually just cycloplegia for pain. Maybe use a topical steroid, Miro, that kind of stuff. Okay, so you've got the kind of the different findings here. So that's a bad apical scar. These are obstriae. No, they're vertical. Voch striae. That's Munson's sign and then the Kaiser. Or sorry, the Fleischer ring is what that's trying to show, but that's pretty hard to see. All right. You love cornea for these because they're really easy if you can recognize the picture because you've got it memorized. So what is it? So granular stromal dystrophy, right? So you've got these little salt granules, sugar granules, whatever you want to look at. They're centrally located. Spare the limbus. There's intervening clear spaces. Um, okay. Which stain would be positive on pathology of a penetrating keratoplasty? So granular gets her man. Granular has what substance? Hyalin stains with mesonchrome. Okay, good. So you you got to have this down. There's usually three or four questions related to it on tests because it's just so easy to test. So we won't spend a lot of time on it here, but. So you've got macular, I just wanted to show you the pictures. So there's another picture of macular dystrophy um, with the hyaline material and the son stain. So the difference between macular- or Sorry, I just said that completely wrong. <laughs> is this, this is macular, right? This is macular. Okay, is, so that one is that it, it extends limbus to limbus? Yeah, it's a little bit broader um, involvement. Um, and there's not really, there's clouding in between them. So that's kind of the key is that there's clouding between the spots. Whereas with granular, it's super clear between the spots is kind of the idea. So it just it kind of looks mushy with macular. Macular is mushy. So macular has what? Sorry. Marilyn Monroe. Mucal with polysaccharides. Really? Recessive. Recessive. All. Always. Really always. Yeah, option blue. Sorry, confusion though. So there's the granular and the stain for it. Okay, and then lattice. So lattice, you're just thinking linear lines with like cracks in the cornea. Um, and there's lots of associated, I, I hated lattice because they could test you on tons of different stuff with lattice. So I felt like, oh, it's lattice. And then it's like, uh, I don't know what you're asking me because it's a little bit of a trickier one because there's all these little like different types here that can be involved. All right, so what does this patient have? So you can see these little <laughs> goots, these plateaus here on what membrane? That's the base membrane. What's kind of missing back here? Okay, so there's not a lot of endothelium. There's a few. So the endothelium can't grow over the top of the guttata, so they're kind of stuck in between here. And then this is actually some pigment granules in between. So you can get sometimes get a little pigment deposition in uh, Fuchs dystrophy. Um, what did this patient have? What surgery? It's not a path slide. It has some surgery. Yeah, PK. Right? <laughs> there's, some, there's stroma here. So they had a PK, which is not how we treat this anymore, right? How do we how do we treat Fuchs now with the surgery? DSEC or DMEC. So a DSEC is essentially going to be probably about this thickness on here. So it's about 60 microns thick of, of some stroma. Whereas a DMEC is what layer? It's, it's only decimase and endothelium, so it's going to be super thin. Okay. So this patient presents with the following complaint. 
constant burning, blurry vision in the morning, blurry vision with reading, blurry vision late in the day. Morning, right? That super high stress on the corneas when the eyes closed creates this fluid filled cornea in the mornings. So it takes them a while to kind of wake up and get that fluid pumping out. How can you help it along? What are some things that you can do to treat that? If they're just presenting with morning blurriness, so Miro, so this hypertonic saline on the surface draws fluid out from the front. Okay. How else? Use a hair dryer. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Put a hair dryer in front of you for a couple minutes. That'll help kind of dehydrate it too. So Fuchs is another one of those that you just have to know everything about it um, because it's just such a very it's very common and highly testable. Um, so it does cluster in families. It's probably autosomal dominant, but we don't really know. Um, but you definitely see it clustering in families, and it seems to have that little kind of uh, I forgot what that's called the lead bias where you like younger people have it worse. What's that called? Anticipation. Anticipation. Doesn't sound right, but like we'll take it. Trying to quit to three beats. Yeah. <laughs> um, so polymegathism can sometimes be the way that it presents where you've got large cells or pleomorphism where the cells are actually different shape. So sometimes you can get what's called gutatilis fuchs. In that condition, they might see that Decimase membrane is just a little bit thicker on the path slide. Um, or on endothelial cell counts, you might be able to tell that there's, there's weird shapes to the cells and stuff. All right. Okay, what is this? So anytime you see something white growing on the surface of the cornea, what should you think of? You, just, you should think of cancer, right? on that spectrum, squamous cell all the way to potentially a mild pterygium, right? Pterygium to squamous cell. So once you get into an abnormal pterygium, you call it a CIN. Um, and so this is a picture of a type of CIN. So you can almost get like a little um, papilloma with it, these kind of fine little vessels that are kind of growing around here too. Another appearance, same thing, right? White plaque on the cornea, leukoplakia. You're thinking CIN to squamous cell. Another one, same thing, CIN to squamous cell. We call it ocular surface neoplasia because we don't know what it is. CIN is technically a pathologic diagnosis, squamous cell is too, so. What about this one? It looks like a pretty regular pterygium. I probably would send this to the pathologist just because of that spot right there. It looks kind of funny, okay? So I usually don't send pterygia to Dr. Mammalus, but if they have something funny about them, they've got like some gelatinous kind of something going on, or the surface seems a little leathery, or they've got white spots on it, they don't send it. Another one, same thing, right? So typically, we might actually try to debulk some of these with topical interferon, especially one that looks like this, that's really angry, blood vessels around it, that's gonna bleed like crazy, those are huge. And so I might try topical interferon to see if we can melt this away. Same thing, just lots of different pictures of the same thing. Same thing? Yes, no? Yeah. Probably not. I think it's probably just a pinguecula. But there's, there's a couple little spots here that's like, well, maybe that's something, I don't know. I'm not gonna do anything about this other than watch it. It's in the slide deck, so somebody took a picture of it, but it looks like a pinguecula to me. What about this one? A little more subtle. You might actually gloss over this one because it's not that angry looking. But you've got this little teeny tiny patch right there. Again, something I'd probably just watch or potentially treat with topical interferon if you can get insurance coverage. Same thing? No? Oh. All right, what's this? Dermoid. All right, so this one looks kind of scary because it's like right at that pupil margin. Even though it's a 2D image, it probably looks pretty, it looks pretty deep to me. I don't, I don't really like this. How are you going to treat it? First step, not the last. Think of the first step. Oh. What? Treat the amblyopia. Yeah. Treat the astigmatism amblyopia. <laughs> That's the first step. 
But you're probably, in a kid, you're probably gonna go after this because this one's gonna be pretty debilitating. There's another one there, dermoid. So they love to have these weird associations like with golden hearts where they have these preolicular skin tabs, tags and other stuff going on. But it's mainly, it's this corneal astigmatism. So you're gonna excise it, but these are usually pretty deep, so you're not probably not gonna get rid of all of it. And you always have to have a graft ready, just in case it gets too deep. You're trying to just shave it off so that it's um, sort of plano with the rest of the cornea, but like a shaved dissection is what they call it. But sometimes you have to do a lamellar implant or transplant. Really crappy picture. What do you think they're trying to show you? You almost have to guess sometimes what you think they're trying to show you. You have this yellow area up here, dermal lipoma. So this is a choristoma. You have the hamartomas, choristomas that will sometimes come up on the test. You have to kind of remember those. Um, but it's mostly just kind of watching something like this or treating it with excision. The other thing that can kind of look like this is if you have um, orbital fat prolapse, where you've got fat kind of coming up um, from behind the septum there. And then this one, kind of all these kind of dermoid type things. This is a dermoid cyst in the upper lid. They're always at a suture. Frontozygomatic suture is the most common one. Um, so these you would either leave them alone or excise them, like if it's causing too much distortion of the lid or if there's some sort of cosmetic reason to remove them. So we're out of time, 7.59. Just ways to think about cornea. It's, it, they just jump a lot. But is this sort of the format of the book cap questions? Sometimes. So I was surprised because I thought, I thought it would be more like opto questions where you've got this long question stem, and then you gotta, you, you know, you're kind of logically kind of stepping through this question, but I think they're more like this. It's more like churn. More like what? The churn, you guys ever use churn? No, no. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. So they're more questions that are literally like. Like short stemmed. So it's literally like one, two, three lines with a picture. Kind of multiple choice. paragraphs, which is really nice. The hard thing was, it's like I need, in a lot of cases, you're like, I need more information to be able to decide, but you just have to kind of go for your best guess. Uh,